Welcome everyone here in Seattle and uh, via webcast from our other offices. Welcome to another episode of the Zillow Speaker Series. Um, I'm extremely excited about this one um, for both personal and sentimental reasons as well as because we happen to be incredibly blessed with one of the most important and influential people in the media business today. Uh, so please welcome Matthew Winkler, the Editor-in-Chief of Bloomberg News. Um, so I said for sentimental reasons because uh, my first summer job was actually working for Mr. Winkler 20 plus years ago. I was a summer intern at Bloomberg where I got this mug. <laughs> and I kept it all these years. This is how important, how, how impactful an internship can be. You, you can tell that it's that old because this is the stock ticker of AT&T. And it's a very cool mug because if you put any hot liquid in it, it actually becomes a color. Uh, I don't know if they still give these out to interns, but the stock ticker stops in, in uh, 1994, uh, which is when I was working there. So I was a reporter at Bloomberg News that summer, which was an incredibly formidable, uh, uh, formative and formidable uh, experience for me. Um, and, and I got to see, uh, to see Matt in, in action back then. And um, what he's built over the last 20 years is extraordinary. So fast forward to today. Uh, 25 years later, um, you have 1,900 plus reporters and editors in 150 bureaus around the world, producing 5,000 stories a day. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Bloomberg is by far the most profitable news operation in the world with revenue of probably close to 10 billion or so. It's a privately held company, so it's hard to, uh, hard to know their exact statistics, although if you'd like to share any, you're more than welcome to. Um, <laughs> And it's a company reportedly, Bloomberg LP, uh, is a company worth reportedly over $25 billion. Um, so this is, this is a, a, a huge company. Um, tell us a little bit about the business model because some of our employees may not be familiar with how Bloomberg News is distributed through the terminal and, and kind of what the business model is for the company. Thanks, and thanks for um, letting me be here with you. Um, there actually are parallels with uh, Zillow uh, and Bloomberg, a lot of them. Um, and it, it starts with uh, uh, two terms and three words. Uh, one is transparency, and the other two words are relative value. And um, I think already those of you here uh, have some idea of where we're going. Um, in the last two decades of the 20th century, there was a major uh, shift in uh, the financial industry worldwide. Um, and that shift was from the sellers of money in all its forms to the buyers of money in all its forms. So it's like going from the sell side to the buy side, or if you like, from the people who marketed securities and debt and equity and all kinds of assets and the folks who were the long-term investors. And Bloomberg, um, in its infancy, started with uh, someone who was a um, kind of a scientist by training, not a, not a, uh, a journalist, not a media person, uh, not an English major. He was a physics major. Um, and uh, he uh, got a degree uh, from Johns Hopkins and then went to Harvard Business School and then was very much a fish out of water at uh, Solomon Brothers in New York for 16 years because he was kind of the geek uh, among the partners. Uh, he became a partner because in the 70s he looked around the trading floor at Solomon Brothers and he saw all these Wall Street journals piled high densely and he said wouldn't it be great to take all the data that's in those newspapers that are piled high densely and everybody's walking around with number two pencils to try to you know uh, navigate through them and put them on a computer and this is in the 1970s. And uh, the partners at the time were very dubious about all this. And they um, said, yeah, you can do that, but you have to do it you know, in your spare time. So he um, bribed a bunch of uh, early programmers with pizza and beer uh, at night, and they came up with something called the B page. Uh, I don't know whether that's related to Bloomberg or not, but it was the B page at Solomon Brothers. And that was the prototype of what became the system. And to give you some idea of how little regard his colleagues in the industry had and his colleagues at the firm had, when the firm became public in 1981, merging with Phillip Brothers, otherwise known as Fibro, 
and Solomon then became a behemoth company. Mike Bloomberg was no longer needed, and he was told to go, and he was given his grub stake, the partnership, and um, they let him leave with his idea, with his B page. Whoops. And the B page became the Bloomberg. And the Bloomberg in 1982 in its infancy was, as I said, these three words in two terms, transparency and relative value. And what he did right away with a bunch of colleagues was be able to show to anyone on a historical or current basis what was cheap and what was expensive. So imagine this, it's 1982. The most important market in the world back then was the US Treasury market because it was the only global market and it was the market that told every other market what to do. The value of the system was that if someone wanted to know today whether one security was cheap or expensive relative to another, sort of like whether one house is cheap or expensive to another house or one neighborhood, you get the idea of Zillow. Well, instantly on the Bloomberg, because all of the data, all of the prices, all of the yields going as far back as you could in the market, say 1942 or even further beyond then, uh, to the present, you would know whether today's price was cheap or expensive relative to every price before it. And that had never happened before. No one had ever come up with this. It's odd to think about it that way. But in 1982, there was no system that could tell the most important fiduciaries in the world what was cheap and expensive in the most important market in the world, the only global market in the world, which was US Treasury. So relative value, very important, and transparency. And that's where it begins. And Bloomberg was part of, I would say, probably the most important part or catalyst of the shift in power and influence from what had been the traditional broker dealers on Wall Street and everything like Wall Street around the world to the investors, the investor class. That was the beginning. So unlocking secret data that lives in secret databases and making it readily available, but behind Although that paywall. data was right. public. It was US government securities. Right. Now, he then would do it with every asset class, and so some of that data that would come in wouldn't be as easy to get. So today there are around 300,000 subscribers paying around $20,000 a year, billions of, in revenue, for these dedicated terminals. Basically on every trading desk, every investor around the world has a Bloomberg machine or access to Bloomberg data. So let's talk about that for a moment. We have all this information that we make readily available for free, and it's advertising supported. Bloomberg has a very different, incredibly profitable business model put all this data behind a paywall. It's one of the only uh, companies that I can think of that in the age of the internet still really gets away with selling data. Most other data has become readily available and free. So has the internet put at risk that business model or, or how has it challenged you? No, I'd say the, the, um, the way Bloomberg has become ever more valuable, ever more indispensable is that um, there isn't a year that passes where there isn't myriad amounts of data, different types of data that have been added and functions that are based on that data to what you received when you bought it the first time, you know, when you, when you signed your contract. So imagine it like this. Every year that passes, there are myriad more functions, there's myriad more data, and you know, just to put it in perspective, as extraordinary as Google search is and all of its peers, there is no way to replicate the accessibility to understanding markets with the speed of the Bloomberg on a Google search. It's impossible. And the reason is you can't get that data as good as the search is that is now on the Bloomberg. And for people who have to make decisions all the time about what to buy, what to sell, the Bloomberg becomes, for them, ever more valuable. So this is everything from prices of stocks and bonds to currencies, commodities, everything real time, 24-7. And economic global. data. And, and uh, you economic know, if you wanted to compare data. Brazil inflation right. to Chile inflation, just like that, right. try doing it instantly right. on a search you can't get it to it as fast as you would on the Bloomberg. So the original business model was to take these dedicated terminals, these, these machines, and 
sell them on an install basis uh, for, you know, today it's around $20,000 a year. Um, I remember it, when I was an intern there having a debate with Mike, who was the CEO at the time, who's now the mayor of New York. Um, and it, it was an open floor plan, just like we have at Zillow, and the CEO and the editor-in-chief were sitting, you know, 10 feet away from the stupid 19-year-old intern. Um, and I said, Mike, why, why these separate dedicated terminals? Why not put it onto the internet, this new thing called the World Wide Web, which was just starting at the time, um, and just put it behind our username and password? And he said, no, no, you dummy, you don't get it. The whole point is that it's a dedicated terminal. It's a dedicated machine. And I said, well, I think at some point it's going to be on a regular PC or Mac just available behind a, a, a paywall. He said, no, it'll always be a dedicated machine. So I think I was, I was right, but I was about 15 years too early. Here's, Discuss. Here's, here's, <laughs> here, here, yeah, you're right in the sense that, you know, when Bloomberg first started, it was a phone company, it was a utility, it was a hardware manufacturer. And we actually had Santa's workshop downtown Manhattan with little chiclet keyboards and Bloomberg's coming off the conveyor belt. Um, it was about five different things um, all at the same time. And remember, this is uh, when I show up in 1990. This is four years before Netscape really introduced the internet as we know it to most of us. Uh, but Bloomberg was, as I said, hardware business, software business, utility, phone company. Um, and um, the beauty of what you would call now the internet age is that once chips became, computer chips became developed enough and um, their power was easily accessible, we were able to get out of the hardware business. We didn't have to make the stuff anymore. We were able to get out of the phone business. We were able to get out of uh, everything except the software business. And so today, um, you could have a Bloomberg terminal of your choosing. You know, it could be your hardware right. if you wish. Um, however, everything inside it is still, as Mike said, the Bloomberg terminal. So let's talk about the culture of the company, because as media companies go, it's clear, clearly a unique business model with a unique value proposition as compared with other media companies. But it's an incredibly unique culture. Um, long before Google and, and Zillow and, and other companies like us uh, made common you know, free candy and lunches and perks, et cetera, Bloomberg was doing that long before. Um, and um, you know, I guess talk about the culture of the company, how you think it's different from other media businesses, and why that's a competitive advantage. I think as you can appreciate, uh, if you have a CEO who says to you and everyone else, I have the best people, and he means it. And you know, when he said it to me when I was a Wall Street Journal reporter, um, in 1988 when I first met him, uh, he literally said, you know, I have the best people. If I told them to jump out the window just now, they would do it. Uh, I've got the best company, you know. And, you know, I said, right, and the dish ran away with a spoon. And uh, he got very indignant. Um, and, um, and he rushed out of the uh, conference room we were in when we first met. And he came back with, if you remember, those old days of Fortran. Most of you don't. You weren't born then, but, you know, the old days of computers where you had those big sheets of paper that came out of the printer from computer code. And he came back and he dumped it in my lap and he said, look, this is every customer we have. Here's their phone number, uh, their name. Call them up for, your, for yourself. You'll see. Of course I did. And, and, uh, and he was right. And, then, and when you say you, know, you have the best people and you stand behind that, um, and you believe it. Uh, it's a very powerful um, catalyst for not only creativity, but collaboration, loyalty, all the things that you want, um, especially in a startup, but also uh, for something that will last and endure. And I would say, you know, that's, that's really it. That's more than anything. He believes in his people, and he always has. It, it, it feels completely different if you go visit Bloomberg in New York or San Francisco or now in the Seattle office, which um, is opening tonight. Um, it feels very different from other newsrooms. It feels 
like Zillow. It feels like an exciting technology company that's alive with energy, um, and, and it's very, very different from most other newsrooms. So let's talk for a moment, actually, about what we were talking about earlier. One of the quirks of this culture is a, a, a policy where when people leave the company, they're not welcome back. Um, with, with very rare exception, if you choose to leave Bloomberg, then farewell, have a nice career, um, which is very different from the world that we live in in technology, where sometimes people will leave a company, go do a startup perhaps, and then go return to the mothership, um, which is kind of the norm for, for most companies. So um, talk a little bit about that decision and how that um, helps change the culture. The rule is uh, essentially if you leave to go work for a competitor, uh, you can't come back. Uh, if you take a break to improve your knowledge and get a degree, uh, that's fine, you can return. If you do community service or you know, go work for the government, that's okay too, you can come back. Um, you know, if you do anything philanthropic, um, all of that is acceptable and you can return. It's just you can't, under the rule, and it's a Mike Bloomberg rule, uh, return if you've gone to work for a competitor. And his thinking uh, has been from inception, and I don't think he's changed it, um, is that, well, what do I say to the, the people who stayed with me uh, when you leave? And what do I say to them when you return? Um, and he doesn't have a good answer for that. And because he doesn't have a good answer for that, the rule of state. You certainly think twice about leaving. Uh, and you would think <laughs> it's a twice about decision. leaving. Um, so other, other quirky aspects of the culture can be summed up in the 300 plus page book uh, that you were kind enough to furnish us with called The Bloomberg Way. Um, you've been described as a, a fastidious uh, grammatician, um, as have I. Uh, those of you who's, who have had your email grammar corrected by me know what I'm talking about or spelling errors. So, so tell us what is the Bloomberg way, what is the writing style of Bloomberg, um, and, and how do you think that, again, is a competitive differentiator relative to others? I would say more than, and my colleagues at Bloomberg know this because they've heard me say it many times, I'd say more than anyone else, um, the inspiration for the Bloomberg way um, is a writer uh, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with in some way or form. Um, he was a student of a Cornell English professor called William Strunk, and uh, he is E.B. White. And they produced a, a little book called Elements of Style, which is still in print. Um, I happily recommend it. It will make your life better. Uh, and it's not a big read. It's not a big book. It's a little book, which is what is so compelling about it. And that book, by the way, E.B. White, uh, those of you uh, I'm sure still know, uh, wrote some amazing stories. Uh, he wrote Charlotte's Web, um, Stuart Little, uh, Trump of the Swan. Uh, these are supposedly children's books, but they're, um, they're gifts um, forever. Um, and he was concerned about precision in language and obviously felt that to tell a story you needed precision in language and every word must count. And uh, when we started Bloomberg uh, News, uh, as I said, Mike Bloomberg was not a journalist. We didn't have a pedigree, we had no lineage, we had nothing going for us. In fact, uh, when we started uh, as reporters, uh, we were confused with an office supply company called Bloomberg downtown Manhattan and people would always say, we don't need any more stationary, stop calling us. Um, so we had to create um, something that would guide us uh, in everything that we did. And the Bloomberg Way was not uh, 300 plus pages in its inception. It was just 25 pages the first year, and maybe it was 50 pages by the time you showed up. Um, but it has evolved, and it is evolved. Unfortunately, has failed the E.B. White test because it's a big book and his book is a, what, it's a little book. No adjectives? No adverbs? Yeah, I what? mean, look, here's the thing, and, and you can appreciate this. When you are responsible for reporting what is said and done, which is essentially what we do, what is said and done, uh, precision is everything because you want people to believe it, trust it, um, 
be able to embrace it. Once you get into the habit of writing with modifiers, which are subjective, adjectives and adverbs, uh, you get to a level where there's a lot of risk and people will question you know, what you're, you're saying. So if you write with nouns and verbs, you skip the modifiers, you write with examples and anecdotes, you show, don't tell, you have a much better chance of being taken seriously and believed and being more credible. And of course, that's a good business because if people believe you and continue to believe you, then they'll continue to read you and trust you. So if you read a story from, without a byline, from Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Times of London about the same topic, about the G8 summit, do you think you could tell which was in which outlet based on the Bloomberg way? Most of the time. Um, we're not infallible. Um, you know, actually a day doesn't pass where I see things that um, I wish hadn't crept into our copy. But for the most part, yeah. I would recognize um, a style that is a Bloomberg style. And for the reporter or the employee of Bloomberg News, the outlet of, for their work is on the terminal, on the wire, which sometimes gets picked up in, in print. Uh, perhaps they also work through Bloomberg TV or Bloomberg Radio. Um, it's a little bit of a different distribution model. Bloomberg Business Week, you acquired Business Week and rebranded at Bloomberg Business Week. It's a little bit different than a reporter from a print publication, for example. I, I sort of think it's sort of like, a, a bit like Netflix in a way for a movie producer or a TV producer, producing content for this sort of alternative channel. And so how does that factor into recruiting for a reporter? Do you have people say, you know what, I love that when my grandmother can see my writing in Newspaper X and if I'm in, on Bloomberg, they can't? Remember, we started Bloomberg News, the last decade of the 20th century, uh, which you, and as I said before, it was four years before Netscape uh, pretty much introduced the internet to most of us, apologies to Al Gore. Um, <laughs> and um, at that time, we said, we did not want to be your father's news service. Uh, we recognized, because we were Bloomberg, that we were, uh, to use that new word, online, real time. 24-7. Um, I said, I came from the Wall Street Journal, um, what I was thinking about then was how can we replicate the context and perspective of a once a day or once a week or once a month platform in journalism real time. So in other words, when the Labor Department releases the unemployment data on Friday at 8.30 a.m. in Washington, how can we get to the point where at 8.31, or even at 8.30 plus 30 seconds, there's 850 words about what this number means, and it's gonna be in your newspaper tomorrow, but it's in Frankfurt at 2.30 p.m., just before the Deutsche Bank is you know, getting ready to close. And that was sort of the dream, is context and perspective real time. And we were thinking multimedia uh, then, as in what we write will be real time, as in you can access it on a computer whenever you want. It will be fit to print, so it means that the, the stories that we write would appear as they did in hundreds of newspapers around the world, because they were customers of ours. It would mean that what we write would appear in a magazine. First it was Bloomberg Markets Magazine, then more recently it was Bloomberg Business Week, a weekly. It would mean that what we write would be used for Bloomberg Television. It would mean that what we write would be Bloomberg Radio, all of which happened in the 90s, uh, save the Bloomberg Business Week acquisition. And so in a relatively short amount of time, Bloomberg News was a multimedia organization where the reporters and editors were writing for five platforms in journalism, if you like, at the same time. And so, yeah, I mean, you, we didn't own a newspaper per se, but we were an electronic newspaper, um, and arguably the first electronic newspaper. And the competitors have increasingly moved towards you as they've cut back. Because it was always about the story. Right. It was never not about anything else. It was always about the story, how you could deliver the story in multiple ways.
I have to ask a question about a controversial topic. As a, a Bloomberg alum, you'd probably think less of me if I didn't bring it up. Um, Bloomberg has had some controversy lately, uh, but I want to take a slightly different angle on it. Um, the issue, for those that don't know, is that um, Bloomberg employees could see when a Bloomberg subscriber had logged on to the Bloomberg terminal. And there was some question as to whether employees were using that to learn certain whereabouts of, of certain clients, customers, subscribers of Bloomberg. And my question for you is, um, everyone sort of knew that in the industry for several years, dating back at least a couple of years when it had come out previously. Um, and it just became controversial now over the last month or so. And I'm wondering um, whether, you know, how much of this controversy do you think has been, um, uh, the, the fans of, the, 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 this has been fanned by competitors trying to make something of something that was sort of an open secret anyway, versus something that's new and serious and, and kind of really worthy of the type of discussion and debate that it's, that it's engendered? Um, well, I leave it for others to decide, you know, uh, ultimately how to judge this. And here's how we've looked at this um, issue. Um, first of all, as you can appreciate, I think here, uh, we've always taken the view the customer's always right. Um, it's generally a good idea when you're in business to think that way. Um, so anytime a customer complains about anything that we do, we take it seriously and we try to address the complaint in any way we can. This particular complaint, uh, which surfaced recently, as you, as you rightly say, derives from something that goes all the way back to the beginning of Bloomberg. It's actually a, a function called UUID. It's like the original DNA that is used to build everything at the Bloomberg. And part of this function, UUID, um, in fact, is necessary to create functions and to create value. Um, and in fact, over you know, almost two decades now, Bloomberg News has created two dozen plus functions for our customers, you know, in the course of gathering uh, information. Like I mentioned, uh, unemployment. Uh, our reporters show up and get the unemployment figure, and when they're getting the unemployment figure, it goes into another bucket on the Bloomberg that is permanently uh, carrying all the data of all the other unemployment numbers. And, um, and then it's able to be compared with all the other unemployment numbers of everybody else's unemployment in every other country. And it all starts with a reporter doing this, and the function was invented by a Bloomberg reporter. So it's really about adding value. Nevertheless, um, you know, more recently, as the issue of privacy has become uh, much more pronounced, uh, and everybody is much more aware of it, we didn't want, as I said in a uh, Bloomberg view uh, uh, a few weeks ago, we didn't want the appearance of something that would be perceived as impropriety to be the reality. And so the only way you can deal with that is to say, all right, let's take a look at all the things that we're doing. And this is really not a major thing for us anyway to begin with. So we can uh, eliminate access to, and essentially what this was, is a function that enables uh, people inside Bloomberg to see whether you're looking at Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel. Actually, on the Bloomberg, there are multiple pieces of information. There's the corporate key. There's the equity key. There's the top function for top stories. There's the eco function for economics. And you could see whether someone was favoring these categories of information or another. But that's really the extent of the use of, of this function. So we just said, look, we don't want people to ever think that we're doing anything that is in any way compromising the integrity of the system, compromising the integrity of our customers. And so we just said, okay, fine. Um, that's it. We won't, we won't do this. Um, but we never got to the point of publishing any stories or using the system that way. As I said, actually, we've used this function, UUID, really to create value for our customers, not the other way around. Um, so my last question, and then we'll open up to the audience, and, and people on webcast can text me if, if you have questions remotely. Uh, this is always a hard one, but look into your crystal ball. Let's say five or 10 years from now, what will Bloomberg LP look like? Um, how will information be consumed through Bloomberg? Do you think the business model will be relatively similar to what it is today? How is mobile impacting the future of your business? Just sort of talk about the future. Sure. Uh, 
I'm not clairvoyant, so it's hazardous to predict anything. Um, I'll tell you what we believe in, and I don't think that we're going to change our values or what we believe in. We really believe that content is everything, that original content is everything, that access to meaningful content is, for us, uh, the most important uh, part of what we do. And we are totally committed to creating more, better, faster content all the time. That we've been that way from inception. I don't think that's going to change. Now, it starts to get um, invigorating every time we think about it because there's so many things that you know we say, wouldn't it be nice if people could see it this way as opposed to that way? Wouldn't that be exciting? And here's what, let me give you an example. And this doesn't exist, surprisingly enough, but we're working on it. Wouldn't it be nice to know what the taxpayer anywhere pays in a fee every time the government finances itself? You know, and you know, the reason why we were thinking about this is we saw one country recently that paid a fee of $500 million to a bank just to sell government debt. And we said, well, the US government doesn't pay a cent on its debt. So wouldn't it be great on the Bloomberg to have a function that told you instantly what everybody pays? The taxpayers it's in the public interest, but I think investors would like to know too, because why should a government pay more than it has to? So I think the model for us is here to stay. I don't think it changes. I think there are going to be myriad ways to look at us, to see us. Um, you know, in your back pocket, in your hand, in special glasses, if that's what it takes. Um, and what you're going to get is more, better, faster content, easier to understand, easier to use, that will help you make better decisions. Questions? Katie. Um, I'm curious, just sort of stepping back from just Bloomberg, I mean, you're one of the kind of few outlets that still does good journalism and makes money. So just looking at journalism in general, I mean, what, what do you see as the future there? Do you worry about it? Um, I don't know if I could say that I worry about it because it's, um, I worry about us. And that's a lot right there. That's enough. I worry about us all the time. Um, what I worry about is, uh, you know, every day, are we good enough? And what I mean by good enough is, are we uh, increasingly accurate, more accurate? Are we increasingly more precise? Uh, are we increasingly more compelling? Are we, you know, the, the definition of news is surprise, if you think about it. You wouldn't call it news if it wasn't a surprise. S at least that's how we look at it. Um, and it has to be true, those two things. I mean, it isn't news unless it's true. And it has to be surprising. Um, so. Um, I'm thinking about that all the time. How do we get to more surprises? How do we figure it out? That requires knowledge. That requires uh, lots of skill about how do you go about finding things out? Um, how do you know how to distinguish between hearsay and a fact? Uh, we live in an age now uh, of spontaneous delivery of thinking, expression, people can say anything, and they do, and there it is. Um, and uh, we have to be very careful, uh, because the age that we're in is constantly information vying with misinformation, and they're coming uh, every day uh, at different, uh, from different perspectives. And I think that the more precise we are, the more accurate we are, the more reliable we are, the more valuable we become. Because if people believe that what we're delivering is something that they can act on, actionable news is what we call it, um, then it has a lot of value. Um, if it isn't actionable, then it doesn't have any value. So um, that, that's what I worry about. Do you see a trade-off between faster content and better content? Um, you know, I, I write something for, I've been doing it for two decades now, called Weekly Notes. And at the end of it, you know, I say seize the day, you know, um, 
more better, faster. Um, words to that effect. Uh, sometimes I say writing well means more, better, faster. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, if we're constantly increasing our knowledge and skill as a news organization, we will be faster. We will be better. Uh, and we should never stop thinking about how to increase our knowledge and skill. Uh, I mean, after all, if you think about a machine which is built by us, um, what are we trying to do? Make the machine run more efficiently, make the machine uh, last longer, make the machine more reliable. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do uh, as journalists is how can we do this better? Better, by the way, always means faster because uh, better uh, means I need it exactly when I need it. Um, and you've got to figure that out. And by the way, that doesn't mean necessarily earlier than when you need it. It means exactly when you need it. So if I'm really thinking the right way, I'm thinking about more, better, faster means how to figure out a way to deliver content to someone precisely at the moment that we need it most. And then we've hit the right spot. Um, and that's a challenge. And that will always be a challenge for us. How involved is Mike Bloomberg now? What's his role? And uh, more broadly, you know, any lessons you've observed on transitioning from a founder CEO to a new CEO? Um, well, I wish I could say that the years have passed by and um, he never emailed me or <laughs> called me. Um, truth be told, uh, he will read something we've written on the Bloomberg and wonder, what was that about? Or why? Because uh, he is a customer, he is a user. And uh, he's never stopped using the product that he invented. So uh, I do hear from him that way uh, often. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes he's missed something, and many times he hasn't. Um, but he has no. Uh, has had no role since he became mayor um, in deciding what we do and how we do it in the company. And he's um, delegated that to the people who have uh, been appointed CEO, chairman, and everybody else, yours truly included. Um, and uh, he is given, you know, every year sort of a summaries of our performance as a company because he still is the owner. So he has an awareness of uh, how we're doing. Um, I think for the most part, uh, as already I think has been revealed here, the culture of Bloomberg is so um, prominent and transparent that the people who are responsible for managing the company um, can't help but not get it sort of the moment that they're on the site of a Bloomberg office. Um, and it's positive reinforcement, I like to think. Um, so uh, the place very much lives on, I think, in the spirit that he created. Um, it's not the same, of course, because he isn't there. And so we don't hear him, we don't see him. Um, but I think the character of the place is very consistent with, uh, with who he is. And uh, the people who are running it are very much um, obedient um, to what he believes in. And the mayoral office, at the mayoral office, Mayor Bloomberg has fam famously ripped out all the offices and created an open trading floor modeled after the Bloomberg type environment. And that's actually become a campaign issue now as others uh, campaign to take his place as he'll be stepping down um, here shortly. Uh, it's become actually a campaign topic of should you have offices or should you have open space for the mayor and for his staff? I think he would say, by the way, on that, um, and he might even in, invoke uh, someone I, th I think he has always had high regard for, is the Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, uh, who once said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We, we talk about that a lot here, right? Turn the lights on in the dark room, and all the creepy crawlies have to sort of crawl away when the lights come on. So we, it's deep in the Zillow ethos as well. Other questions? 
Going back to the um, better is, is faster, faster is better. Um, how do you reconcile that with the sort of old newspaper adage that it's better to be right than to be first? If you can be both, obviously be both, but you know, in, the, in its sort of TMZ model where it's better to just put it out there even if it's not 100% accurate or where there's quick developing stories or whatever, how do you re uh, reconcile those two kind of competing aspects? I mean, the, the short answer is with difficulty. Um, the uh, thing I said before, uh, which everybody needs to understand, is if it isn't true, it isn't news. So wh whatever you produce, if it isn't accurate, if it isn't true, you're not in the news business. You're in some other business. Uh, since we're in the news business, it means that accuracy above all else. Uh, there is no other um, goal for us, accuracy above all else. Um, now, we have something at Bloomberg, in the Bloomberg way, it's in, in that book, it says this is what we're meant to do every day. We want to be, it's sort of five words, they all begin with F and none, one you think. Um, we want to be the first word because if you're not the first word, it's not clear you'll be in the news business. Because um, remember, you have to be the one surpri surprising people. You have to deliver the surprises. So we want to be the first word. We want to be the fastest word because uh, nothing is fixed. Um, things change. Um, just when you thought it was one way, it could be another way uh, soon enough. We want to be the most factual word. Because um, as I said, unless you're um, accurate, you're not in the news business. We want to be the final word because that gets to the point I was making before about context and perspective, and we want to be the future word. Uh, wouldn't we all want to be able to deliver some idea of what tomorrow looks like based on what we know today? So those are the five things that we try to do at Bloomberg News, five words that begin with F. Uh, easier said than done, uh, but that's our aspiration. A question from the San Francisco office back to uh, Mayor Bloomberg's involvement and, and kind of the, the shadow that he has over the company. Um, have there been times that your reporting has been challenged by the fact that he is who he is and he is the majority owner of the company? Um, specifically, the question is, a politically active and elected founder, has that been an asset or a detriment to the company? Obviously, it's been an asset in many ways, but there have been times yeah. when it's also been a detriment. We had a, an agreement when we started Bloomberg News, um, and obviously long before he uh, decided to go into public service that we wouldn't cover ourselves, that we wouldn't report on ourselves. Now, there are some obvious challenges that have come out of his uh, being mayor of New York City. Uh, not too long before he became mayor, uh, we decided we had to cover New York City as part of covering everything else. And the reason is, as you can imagine, New York City is the financial capital of the world. Um, so not to cover New York City in the context of covering finance and uh, the financial industry didn't make a lot of sense. So we had a reporter at City Hall, and next thing we know, um, our owner uh, is now the mayor. Uh, and we could have said, okay, we're shutting down our City Hall Bureau uh, now that he's mayor, but we thought we could be very transparent about how we would cover uh, City Hall and the mayor, and it's um, in a sense very Bloomberg way, as in very factual. Um, we're not going deep. We leave that to others, if you will, um, because we would consider it a conflict of interest if we tried. Um, and that's pretty much been the policy. Uh, now, you know, since we've gotten to be much bigger and more influential. Um, you know, the question's been raised from time to time, should we cover ourselves the way other news organizations cover themselves? And it's a question that we're dealing with right. without an answer. So you'd see, for example, the New York Times, oh, uh, you know, the New York Times reported this quarterly earnings or this executive change, et cetera, they report on their own, on themselves, and you're right. saying Bloomberg doesn't do that type of coverage? No, I mean, what we, it, it, we leave it to our public relations department to put out the statements, press releases, whatever. We make sure that they're linked and categorized as documents of some sort, like everything else. And uh, when people write about us or write about uh, people like Mike Bloomberg, we make sure that 
that's linked, so you can find it if you want it. So I have a question about cable news. Um, you have one cable news channel that has had massive success focused with a particular agenda on the right, and you have another uh, with an agenda on the left, and you have another one sort of trying to find its way kind of in the middle. And, and Bloomberg is sort of in this different space from, from a TV journalism standpoint around financial journalism. When you, when you look at, at TV cable news, not just financial journalism, but, but general news, um, do you look at that and say, d does that disappoint you that you see kind of, oh, it's partisanship that has e equaled ratings? Or is it, well, that's just programming is what it is and that's sort of the way TV works. What's your perspective on, on TV, on cable news? Um, it's really my perspective on news, which is that I think we, the world would be a better place if news was serious in the sense that it was serious about reporting, as I said, said and done. Uh, sadly, um, there are other variables that change uh, the agenda. Um, one of them, I think, is entertainment. Um, the more entertaining something can be, um, higher ratings, more visibility, more viewers, um, and it ceases to be about serious pursuit of the truth or accuracy and more about what's entertaining. I think there's a lot of that in television uh, because television is inherently a medium that mostly provides entertainment uh, for people. And uh, unfortunately, I think news gets um, co-opted uh, in that bargain. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's unfortunate. Other questions? Diane. This is our editor-in-chief. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Um, how closely were you involved in the coverage of the Bernie Madoff scandal as it was emerging? Were you actively involved in deploying reporters and so on and how you were going to pursue it down the road? And also, do you have other um, fail-safe kinds of policies in place to catch other transgressions in the business? Uh, you know, the, the definition, I think, of a manager is getting people to do what is in their best interest that they wouldn't necessarily do themselves. And uh, tried to remember that in the course of building Bloomberg News, which is uh, what you want to see is everybody, uh, it's kind of like a, um, a play or um, some kind of production where lots of people have different parts to play and they all have to be in sync with each other and they all have to be doing uh, exactly what they're meant to do at exactly the right time. And uh, the managers are there to make sure people are in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So I like to think that the structure that we had at Bloomberg News um, at the, the moment when you, you mentioned uh, the Madoff, um, uh, affair came along, um, we were prepared. I mean, and that's the other thing is uh, what, what's a manager meant to do? Prepare people so that they're prepared. The more prepared you are, the luckier you get. So if you're prepared, you're in the right place at the right time um, and uh, you'll be rewarded for being prepared. And so uh, we had all the reporters and editors in place when that um, unfolded when that event unfolded and so we were in a position to cover it um, as we were s supposed to cover it so it really didn't change anything for us and you know I uh, was involved to the extent that uh, we hadn't seen this one before uh, and uh, so uh, my curiosity was uh, it, it very much uh, piqued by uh, the Madoff uh, scam and uh, so I couldn't help but talk about it as much as I could uh, with everybody. But it's um, something that um, coincided with reporting that was already underway. And uh, I can't take credit for uh, really how we went about it. I think that the team that we had did an extra, you know, really extraordinary job. And uh, they would have done it whether I was there or not. Last question about uh, personal brand building of reporters. Um, historically, ages ago, reporters typically didn't have bylines by name. Now I sometimes see them, sometimes don't. 
um, through, through Bloomberg. Um, but social media has changed things somewhat. So you see reporters now tweeting on their own, for example, or building their own Facebook pages and building their own personal following, or using their TV perch to build personal brand, and then sometimes switching, switching, um, switching media outlets. So I guess, can you just talk about the individual role of the reporter relative to Bloomberg Inc. Um, and personal brand building in an age of social media? Um, we initially didn't have uh, bylines. Every story by Bloomberg News said by Bloomberg News. And as we evolved um, by the end of the first decade of Bloomberg News and the end of the 90s, we decided uh, really the reporters deserve better than that. Uh, they deserve the recognition. And so we um, made sure everybody got bylines. And the only exceptions to that uh, are there are a handful of countries uh, that discriminate against their own nationals. Uh, that is to say, they say that they can't have a byline for Bloomberg News if they're Chinese and they work in Beijing for Bloomberg. And so we said, well, we're not going to uh, discriminate against our own employees. So every story that um, is produced from Beijing says by Bloomberg News, because we're not going to uh, say some people are more equal than others. Uh, I say that's a handful of situations. Um, tweeting is a wonderful uh, invention and uh, we happily embrace it. Uh, we just have a rule that says if you're going to tweet anything, make sure two pair of eyes look at it before it's tweeted so that it's true. And I must, you can claim, I must slow things down a little and bit. You can, claim, you can claim credit for it. All right. um, have you had an example yet where a reporter, or perhaps a TV personality that's built up of 100,000 plus Twitter followers then leaves Bloomberg and you have to debate who those, whom those Twitter followers belong to, or, or that hasn't, hasn't happened yet? Hasn't happened to us yet. Um, well, congratulations on building such an amazing company. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.